Hey, it's such a pleasure uh, to be here. I have not had an opportunity uh, to, to be part of uh, one of these events yet, but I'm curious how many folks in the room have been to What Matters to Me and Why? Okay, so you all know that you're in for a, for a real treat. Uh, this is going to be exciting, but the first time uh, for me to, uh, to do this. Um, we are all incredibly busy. Um, our lives here at work take us in lots of different directions as physicians, as uh, nurses and caregivers, as administrators, as students, as faculty. Uh, we're all going in a million different directions. What uh, this particular opportunity allows us to do is to pause from our really, really busy schedule and get to know in a very much more personal way folks that are making incredible differences in our uh, environment. And today is absolutely uh, one of those. Speakers give a, a short and very informal uh, kind of, uh, of talk um, about who they are, what they are, what has formed them, what their values are, their beliefs, really uh, who they are as a, as a person and as a, as a key uh, staff member uh, here in our, in our organization. Um, there's going to be time for questions, and we want them to be really probing, tough questions, so be thinking about, uh, about, about those. Um, there's really no prescribed uh, topic. It's, uh, in this case, Amanda is going is to share uh, some of her background and what makes her uh, who she is. So uh, with that, I will uh, turn it over. Oh, um, we do want to give um, you all just a few minutes, uh, maybe a minute, to get to know one another, just the folks that are next to you. So I want to make sure, take 60 seconds, introduce yourself if you don't know the person next to you. I'm uh, happy to see the room full. Literally, it looks like it's close to standing room only. I think that's a testament to Amon, all of us who know her and love her. But I also think it's a testament to this program. And, and last year we kicked off with uh, KB Lay Buckland. I don't know if Dr. Lay Buckland's here. There she is. KB did a fantastic job and really um, allowed us to hear and learn more about her, someone else that we, that those of us who knew her loved, right? So I don't know if everybody here knows Amon, but when you finish, you'll love her. If you already know her, you already love her. So it's good. So, so uh, you can find videos of the, of the talks, including today's talk. That's why we had the warning about the videotaping uh, on the What's Matter to Me and Why website in case you missed the last one and want to hear it or in case you have to leave early today for any reason, uh, et cetera. It's our hope to continue this program uh, here at the Medical Center for those who work and study here at Orange. I now have uh, an office on both campuses, so I live and work at both places, literally sometimes. Uh, the living part, that is. Uh, as uh, Rachel mentioned earlier, um, we want you to all also please complete the survey because that's how we get um, great ideas and great people that we may not be as familiar with uh, on our campus. And I, uh, I'm obviously very familiar with Dr. Lane Buckland and I'm very familiar with him on, but there are undoubtedly people doing amazing work and having amazing stories to tell that I don't know or that Larry doesn't know. So please fill out the survey and give us some great suggestions so we can have a diverse perspective of uh, voices for the series and make sure people realize that this is an opportunity open to anybody uh, at any level or area within our enterprise. So um, now I'll introduce Iman. Uh, as the patient flow director at the UCI Medical Center, Iman is responsible for the efficient and orderly administration of daily clinical operations in the practice, including but not limited to patient quality and safe journey from admission to discharge, scheduling efficiency, and general problem solving, which is probably her best skill. <laughs> uh, she manages and optimizes clinical and business operations across the practice, identifying, recommending, and implementing initiatives to improve clinical workflow and business efficiency. And always she does it with a smile, quite frankly. Uh, powered by really passion and pragmatism, and she trains and supports staff and managers to maximize patient experience, which we all know is why we're here. Uh, Iman holds two master's degree and a doctor of nursing practice degree in nursing leadership and has over 24 years of nursing experience with the last 10 years in management. And um, I just say it's been a pleasure for me to get to know her uh, at a very small level. So I really look forward to getting to know her at a deeper level today with this opportunity. And um, please join me in welcoming Iman off into the podium to share with us. 
matters to her and what? Um, when uh, they give me this opportunity, I, um, it took me a while to think, what exactly matters to me? So I created the first PowerPoint. I sent it to Rachel. And she said, no, I need to set you up with Dr. Fink. And uh, after I met him, I changed the PowerPoint again. And then I met him again. And then I changed my PowerPoint for the third time. <laughs> and then I presented to one of my best friends, and I changed it yesterday for the last time. <laughs> so it was not easy, actually. One of the things I understand today, it's not actually easy to find what matters to us till you go deep inside you and figure out that it's not easy to figure out what it's really matter to us. So I would like to share with you and thank you for allowing me sharing what matters to me. So uh, one of the things that I know that I was always trying to do is reaching my potential. What is my potential? Where actually my potential? What's mean potential? So I was trying always to reach what is the potential and two things I got from my journey is I will never allow anybody to tell me you cannot do it. I'm going to do it. I don't know how. I'll figure it out, but I'll do it. The second thing is if I am comfortable, then I'm not doing anything. I should be always out of my comfort zone so I am doing something different. If I'm comfortable, I go to usually to Pat and say, move. I need something in you. <laughs> it's not happening. So, and even my team, they kept telling me, are we gonna be one day this way, just a break? No, there's no break because I don't know how to be in a comfort zone. So that's being said, I wanna share four things with the team today that actually the values that I got from my journey and what matters to me. So choices is number one or decision, it make a big, big difference, the choices we make. The second thing after you make your choice, you need to believe that every choice, it takes a process and takes time. If you believe your choice is gonna just make it happen, it's wrong. Everything has a process and you need to wait. You need to be patient, which is I miss a lot of time. But I keep reminding myself, I need to be patient. If I chose that, I need to be patient. The second thing, the third thing is every choice I made I need to make in front of it some sacrifice. I need to pay the price. There's no success and there's no choice without some sacrifice. So I know I need to pay the price somewhere else, but I need to pay it in a way that I can handle it and I can absorb it. The last thing is, which is known about me, the minute you give me a problem, I think creative about it. I am, one of my team told me, are we gonna be one day in the box? Because I always telling them, we need to think out of the box. <laughs> so the team is telling me, can we be in the box one time? And it's like, no, out of the box is where we land. And that's where we're going to be successful. So through my journey today, you're going to see all these four things coming along. And you're going to see why it is different for me and why it matters to me. So let's start with the starting point. Where did I start and how Iman started it? So let me share some of my family's pictures. So my grandma, my grandparents, both from both sides, mom and dad, my grandparents, my mom, my dad, and where I came from originally, I am from Jerusalem, Palestine. This is where I originally. I just want to let you know, as a Palestinian, if you know what's mean Palestinian, we believe in education as our survival mode. So education is number one. Just to give you an example, my, grand, my grandma, he had his master's degree in 1950. My dad had his second master's degree in engineering in 1964. So education is not a choice for us. It's a must in my family. So that's what drive me to see me here today. And by the way, uh, female, also have a part. So my grandma and my mom, at least they have a high school or college level. We don't have anybody less than that in my family. Another thing in my family I would like to share, which is I broke it, and this is one of the things I broke in my family. My family for more than 100 years, they marry each other. There's nobody out of Othman for any reason. And I was the first generation to marry somebody out of Othman. 
And I was isolated from the family for many years because I married somebody out of Othman. You mean the client? Yes. So now they accepted me back because they believe my husband worth it. <laughs> so we'll talk about my husband in a minute. So this is our, my grandparents and my parents. Next, this is me. I was three months years old. And I have six siblings. Three, we are three girls and three um, sons. And um, those are my parents from different. This is my dad uh, when he got his second master degree in engineering in um, American University from Lebanon. So I want to share something about my humble mom. A lot of people, they don't mention their moms in their lives. But I want to mention something about my mom. My mom taught me to be who I am, to be as simple as I can. Every time I go to a complicated place, I always remember my mom told me, go back to the basics, you will find the solution. And I believe that's right. Every time we stick to our basics, we are going to find our way. She told me that I need to be respectful. I need to take responsibility. And I think Pat can witness the responsibility part and everybody in this room. I'm very accountable to my own operation. And also, I need to follow my inner voice, which is a lot of people maybe in this room and out of this room, they don't like this about me because I'm very passionate. And I follow my inner voice because I believe my guts is always telling me where is the right way. And kindness, which is I try my best to show people I'm kind. I'm not that impulsive as you think. <laughs> but I am very passionate, and that's what makes the kindness covered. One of the things I want to talk about respectful, and I, this is always also I share it with my team and with my boss. Respect is a red line for me. The minute you cut this line, I cannot continue the relationship. It's going to take many, many many times to continue a relationship that doesn't have a respect. So respect is a very red line for me. And sometimes I think me respecting others making me also not reaching my potential because my background is coming from respecting at number one. So respect is very important, things that I learned from my mom. To the point my mom was not allowing me to open any fridge at my sister's house. You're not, I'm not allowed to open a fridge in my sister's house or my brother's house. I am not allowed to keep seated when there's an elderly in the room. I am not allowed to sit down in a bus when I have another pregnant lady is in the bus. That is respect for us. And I've been learned this way, and I cannot deviate it from that way. I cannot see a sick patient is suffering, and I'm sitting doing nothing. And this is why I am here today, and why I am a nurse, is what my mom taught me. I need to feel with others, and I need to respect others. So let's talk about my first choice that we talked earlier, right? So the first choice after I finished my high school, I got, of course, as everybody know, I'm a straight A person. I don't know how not to be a straight A in school. So my dad wants me to be a physician. And I said, no. Why? It's a long journey. I'm not going to make a difference in people's life if I'm going to do MD and physician. I need a short journey, but I need to make a difference. And when I went to nursing school, he lost his mind. In Jordan or Palestine, nursing yet did not have that reputation. So when I chose to become a nurse, it was a big shock for him. But I chose nursing because for many reasons. We can make a difference. We never stop learning. And the most important, we keep lives. And we deal with lives. And that's where is my passion. This is where I want to be. So I graduated in 1994 with a bachelor degree. And I was only 21 years old when I got my bachelor degree. And I graduated from the American University in Jordan. And it's still it's the biggest American university in the Middle East. And they taught all uh, staff, American and Canadian, and been teaching in English all the four years. And then after that, I decided to make a fast choice. Get married. I'm not going to wait. Because I met a very good guy. So that's my husband. And he is a nurse, too. And um, we met over a CPR. The patient died. <laughs> but I got a very good husband after that. <laughs> so we had uh, three boys together. And um, those are my boys. And I have uh, a simple family here. This is from my wedding day. By the way, we met in. Um, we met in March, and we got married in July. I was fast. I don't have time. 
I have a choice, I have something I need to be done. Until now, I'm like this. I have something else I need to do. I'm not, I'm not gonna be, uh, I don't have time for engagement and know each other and I need to move. So I have, and the first son came exactly one year after, the second one two years after. And then I said, that's it, I'm done with two boys. And then everybody telling me, if you don't have a girl, you will never have a nice family. And it took me seven years to make a decision. Okay, let me try one more time. And here is it. <laughs> my mistake. <laughs> my third boy, my drama queen, he have all the girl stuff, but he is not a girl. <laughs> but I love him to death, and he is, the three boys are my life, and um, I think God gave me what I can handle because now I have some of my best friends have girls and I cannot handle drama. <laughs> Hormones, not my part. So I'm happy with my family. This is my first choice I made and I'm happy with this choice. So I wanna s tell you about when you have a dream and you have a plan and you have passion and suddenly something different happened to you, you don't give up, you just change the direction. You start to adapt and change the direction. And that's when I had my first son, Abby. He's a special need boy. We discovered that when he was three years old. He is uh, 22. He just graduated from high school last year. And by the way, I graduated from my uh, doctorate degree and he graduated from high school in the same year last year. So it was a very nice, and we had only three days between our graduation, between my graduation and his graduation. And uh, let me tell you, um, I'm thankful, I'm grateful. And the most important part of having Abby in my life, I am so forgivable. I forgive people because people doesn't know what you mean to have a special need in your life. It's a decision I took and a choice I took to handle the son and I'm not gonna give up Abby at any level. He is my blessing and he is the one who made a meaning to my life. So let's talk about my third choice. So I joined nursing. I created a family, and then I decided to go back to Bedside and practice uh, nursing in Jordan. So I uh, worked in a heart center as an open heart ICU RN, and then I joined the cancer center, a new cancer center, and the only cancer center in the Middle East. Uh, it was um, um, King Hussein Cancer Center, and still have a very uh, well reputation center in the Middle East till now for the cancer. So I spent a good um, uh, six, seven years of nursing bedside in, uh, in Jordan, and uh, I can tell you, uh, it built a different nurse in me. And um, I, by the way, I wa wa moved from open heart to oncology. This is a huge shift, right? But I moved to oncology because I thought that they need my help. And I can make a difference with them. Open heart, they come and leave five, five three, four days and they leave. I don't see any difference. And they are most of the time sleeping in ICU. So I don't see my effect. I don't see my influence, you know? So I chose to go there. I cried a lot and I laughed a lot, but I have a lot of good memories there and I will never forget. Th this five years in oncology made who I am now. It's the real nurse. I found this is the real call I have. So we talked about choices, we talked about waiting for the process, and we talked about the price I need to pay and all these things, but what's next? So my husband decided after a couple of years of our marriage, four or five years, okay, Iman, I think we are done. We need to move to US. What? Where? Why? We are here good. We have our own job. We have very good, stable life. Why I need to leave this and go to, to US? He said, it's my dream and I wanna go there I, and I want you to follow me. Do you know what's mean to, to leave what you love and the people you love and to come to a place you don't have anybody? Did you ever try that? It's the worst feeling. I was homesick for more than three years. I was depressed. I was like, what kind of decision is this? Why I'm here? Oh, uh, let me add one more thing. I cannot work right the minute I come because I need to do the NCLEX. I need to prove that I'm a good nurse. So I need to go through the journey from the zero with two kids in my lab. So that was and I came to California directly. I didn't go to any other state. California, and I stayed in California. So here is my journey as a Muslim woman in the US. Let me tell you, it was not easy. 
people, the minute they see my hijab, they judge me with who I, how I look, but they don't judge me as what I can do. It's a lot of challenges, a lot of Islamophobia in the US that I needed to face and I needed to educate people around me. And I needed really to step up. And one thing saved me all these years is the good attitude. I always keep a good attitude. I always remember, even when I'm driving, I'm gonna drive right most of the time, <laughs> if I'm not in a hurry. And I say, people are watching me. I need to be a good Muslim. I need to be a good citizen. People are watching me. I'm gonna be the ambassador of a good Muslim woman leader in the US and I'm gonna believe in that and I'm gonna do that. Other things, beside my background, beside my religion, beside all these, does really women move fast in the US? No, in the leadership. So it takes a lot of hard work. No offense for male, but we do f at least the double of the work to prove <laughs> that we handle this position and we can be good. So my team keep telling me, really Iman, you are here till 8 p.m. Yes, it's okay, I'm fine, but I need to prove to everybody in the UCI that I can handle it and I can move to the next step and I deserve it. So hard work really pays for the women. So let me tell you a part of when I came to the US. So I worked in too many areas I taught. I worked uh, uh, in many hospitals. Uh, this is one of the events we have to wear all the old nursing uniforms and I still remember that event. I had a wonderful 10 years of bedside care here in the US and I learned a lot from uh, many um, areas in the US. Um, I taught for two years and then I found I am not a good teacher. So I moved out. So what's next? Really? I moved to the US, I worked as a nurse, I passed the NCLEX. What next? Does Iman gonna stay a bedside care nurse? What is the opportunity here I can do to move next? So here we are. I decided to pursue and continue my education. So I took my first degree in 2007 in informatic, nursing informatic. And this lady, Dr. Javari, she saw me and I was applying to nursing leader, uh, uh, MSN nursing administration. And she took me from a class and she said, you don't belong here. Let me tell you where you belong. And she took me to informatic and like, here is where you belong. I was like, no, I don't like data. No, numbers, no. <laughs> and she said, you don't know your potential. Come here, I'm gonna take you. And I was straight A from nursing informatic in 18 months, not even at two years. I graduated in 18 months and I was pregnant with my third one, possible girl. <laughs> and I passed that and I was so proud. I got my degree and I moved on. And then after a while, I decided that ah, informatic is not taking me where I want. I need to do something in leadership. So I went back to school and I got my MSN. And then after that, uh, my previous CNO, Marilyn Knighton, she said, uh-uh, MSN is not enough. You took the road, you're gonna go all the way to the doctor degree. Are you kidding me? I have three kids, I have full-time job. I'm not gonna do that. And she said, you're gonna move it. And she pushed me. And I went to doctorate uh, school, uh, hair choice. She chose the program for me. And she registered me and she called me to her office and she said, here's your registration form. You're gonna join next fall. <laughs> I was like, what? She pushed me and then, unfortunately, things happened. I was moving in my ladder and I'm growing fast during my uh, uh, master degree and doctorate degree and I went to this guy. <laughs> and we will talk about this guy soon. <laughs> so, I, the minute he came, I said, listen to me, I have one year to finish my doctorate degree. You need to handle it. I cannot do everything in UCI and do my, my last year of doctorate degree. And he said, Iman, I'll support you, move on. The minute he gave me the, my director and promotion, I was like, yes, he's supporting me. Iman, we have a strike. <laughs> okay, we need to prepare for it. And I dropped the school and I said, okay, it's okay, it's only one quarter. I finished that, I got the first strike right safe and successful, and I said, that's it, I'm joining the school again. Iman, we have a second strike. <laughs> Sir, do you know what's mean that? Like, Iman, we're gonna do it together. And a third one, 
and a fourth one, and a fifth one, and a sixth one. And I was like, Pat, am I going to do the doctorate degree anytime? And he said, you know what, Iman? We signed the contract. Just move on. And I did the one year in seven months. And I told him, leave me alone <laughs> for six months. I promise you, I'll be graduating, and I will not bother you. And he's like, Iman, you have it. And literally, he gave me a good six months. He did not add anything to my plate. But he kept everything else. <laughs> <laughs> then I graduated last year in 2019 with a doctorate degree with an honor um, um, a class, and I was so happy I finished it at the end. So let me tell you what happened during the six, seven years of studying and what else happened. So um, when I started my master's degree, my, um, when I finished my first one, I joined San Francis Medical Center in Los Angeles as a nursing administration and education director. And I started my journey there in San Francis. And uh, one of the best things I did in San Francis, that they've been struggling to have a stroke um, certification, comprehensive certification for seven years. I brought it for them in 12 months. They put me the lead, and I got it in 12 months. After that, my CNO, Marilyn Knight, and she said, you are good, let's get the STEMI. Seriously. And she gave me the STEMI project, and I got the STEMI certification for San Francisco in six months after that. So in the same two years, I got two certification for San Francisco, and after that, they put it for sale, and they were sold. <laughs> because they are better in the market now. So at that point, I couldn't stay with my uh, CNO, and I needed to move. And I was like, what is my next step? Where do I want to go? And then MLK, Martin Luther King, the new hospital, they, the CNO there, she saw me in a conference, and she said, I want you in my project. And she introduced it to me, and then I agreed. And I was like, OK, I'm going to join that. And my job was the nursing operation to open a new hospital in 18 months. You know what's a mean hospital? When I went to MLK, it was only walls and doors. 18 months later, we received the first patient. And we opened with Joint Commission and CDBH with zero findings. And I'm so glad to have that in my resume. Do you know what it means to open a hospital with zero findings? If you don't know that, let me tell you. It's another presentation. <laughs> All I can remember. I was working 16 hours plus every single day. Because this is a hospital that is serving underserved area, and a community needed that hospital. So I did everything to make sure that hospital is going to be open at the best. And it was the MLK opened with a, a, a partnership. If, and I, a lot of people maybe doesn't know. But Martin Luther King, 50% is for UCLA. So 50% of. Martin Luther King going to UCLA, and it's run by UCLA physicians. So it's a huge thing. So I was always running between UCLA, UC Santa Monica, and Martin Luther King to open the hospital. And here is why, where I was in UCLA most of the time. And then after that, somebody from UCLA, which is the before Patty and all Karen, she saw me in UCLA, and she's like, I have a place for you in UCI. And I was like, Oh, no, I am happy where I am. I love where I am. And she said, no, 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 I have a very good place for you in UCI. Let's talk. And she made a very good offer. I couldn't say no. So I left for one important reason, for people to understand. I got demoted when I came to UCI. I did not get the same level I was in Los Angeles. But the only thing made me accept the demotion and less income is the four miles away from home. <laughs> That was me. And my kids need me. And I don't want to spend three hours going back and forth. So I said, my kids need me now. I need to do the sacrifice. Remember the sacrifice we talked about? That's one. That's one of the sacrifices. Like, I can demote myself, but I can prove to people here in UCI, I deserve to be in a better place. And I'll work it out. So I moved to UCI. And let me tell you, a lot of achievement in UCI. Lots of achievement. Within eight months, I was <laughs> promoted with Patty's help to patient flow director. And after that, that did not stop giving me projects. <laughs> and here we are. And we are moving. And we're going to continue moving and working with the projects. I have a lot of achievement in UCI. And a lot of people know my achievement in UCI. And I'm still proud of most of the things I did. One of the most important things that UCI can feel is the staffing. 
we were in a different staffing level when I came, and now we are a different level of staffing. And also, I changed the float pool. And I, I started it with a team of 98. Now I have 260 employees. And obviously, we are growing. We are not going anywhere else. So I am proud, and I'm happy that I'm UCI, and I think I'm in the right place. So let me tell you about my team. The reason why I'm here. The team that they believe in me and they follow me. And I will never be where I am today, specifically here today, without that team. The team that believed in me, followed me. And guess what? I reached to the point today, if I say, for example, Felicia, I'll have six people coming to my office. Yes, what do you want? Because people believe that that I am doing something and I'm making a difference and they can see it. And because of that, they follow and they believe me. This team is the reason of my success at every step. I believe those people is the reason why we are here today. You are the success of UCI, not us. We are just the messengers. My team is the real success of this UCI or we are here today. I just wanna let you know this team specifically and this team they are my family in the US. When I have a moment, I call them because I don't have anybody else than them. Two days, two nights, I called three of them and I was crying over something and they just handled me and next day we just forget it and we moved on. This is my team and this is my family and I'm so proud to be one of their team. I'm gonna continue talking about my team because this is a different level here. We are talking about engagement. Did anybody know here that I have the highest engagement team in UCI for the last three years? Do you know what was my engagement level before I came and handled the float pool? We were 2.11. Do you know where are we now? <coughs> Out of five. We are at 4.12 for the third year in a row. If you think that making an engagement for one unit is difficult, just try it when you have a virtual team like my team. They are in every unit. I don't have a unit. They are in every unit. But let me tell you, I have a wonderful team that they reach to the next level with their own efforts. When I came, we did not have a, a float pool nursing council, and now they have nursing practice council for the patient flow, and they have an opinion, and they run the department. So what is the value from the journey I just shared with you? First of all, I consider myself the ambassador of the Arab woman here, and I am gonna continue doing it because I'm proud of where I came from, and I'm gonna continue doing it the right way, hopefully. The second, I will ensure always that my value align with the, with the organization I work with, which is UCI aligned with my values, and I'm gonna continue doing it because this is the reason for my success and my team's success. The third thing, I always look for inspiration on in the people around me. And I have a lot of leaders and people around me that inspire me every single day. Every single day. From a, from a, a humble EVS who comes every day to my office, all the way to our CEO who just saw me today and he attended my presentation without even me knowing that. It means a lot to me that this organization is running the same value I have. I appreciate that. The last thing, which is obviously everybody know now, I am not ashamed of sh saying or, or owning my success. I am so happy to own my success and I'm so happy to share it with all of you because it is so Im important to inspire other people about what does it mean to be a successful leader. If I am successful, because of you. So with this, it's your turn. What an incredible, inspiring story, as I knew we would hear, even though I didn't know what the story was. So thank you for sharing. First question, I have an 18-year-old son at home. Can I share that with him? Definitely. Thank you. Definitely. <laughs> for the facility that's been open in Irvine, so will you be involved? If they allow me, why not? I love that. Why not? 
If they ask Pat that question. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know that I already opened a hospital, so I think I will. <laughs> Hi, so I love your story, but I have a question about your family and how you said that you were the first one to not marry an open. Yes. And then you married him. It took your family a while to accept your husband. How do they feel now that you moved? He moved you to California. Oh, I am now the golden chicken. I am. <laughs> I am the fi I am the CFO of that family. Are you kidding me? <laughs> so yes, they accept me as I am. Thank you. That was a very inspiring story. Uh, is that my song? I can hear you. How much was it working? Anyway, I love to hear. Where did you get your courage? You have so much courage to push forward through so many obstacles. Where does that come from? Yeah, um, she asked me, where do you get your courage? And to gut all these obstacles. I think he should hear it first as my husband. He's very supportive. I talk and he listen. <laughs> um, um, let me tell you, he's a great man in all aspects. And I love him and I miss him. He is not here, otherwise he will be attending today. It's okay. I had another question. If sure. we could go back a couple of slides. I wanted you to explain one of the pictures, if you don't mind. Right there, the bottom right. I didn't, this I didn't, one? No, the bottom right, the far, the other one. Yes. I didn't see you in the picture, first of all, and you were talking about your team. Yeah. So. One of the things made the team um, engagement um, scores high that I always do activities. And one of the first activity I did, we created a, a soccer team. And Pat was, was involved, remember? And we lost eight for that time, I remember. <laughs> it was bad. And I was very free, by the way. I tried to work it out for him, but it did not work. <laughs> so, but... Um, we give a medal for each one of them and they still remember. And um, actually, because it was a very successful event, they are asking me again to do it this year. So we're going to do a volleyball this year. I just told Pat yet, yesterday so that they would like to do you're it. You're involved, just so you know about okay. it. <laughs> I haven't told you yet. So. Can I bring my son? He, does, he actually plays volleyball. Yes. <laughs> Our secret weapon. Can I bring his son? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So we have a lot of activity. Uh, I just want to let you know we did hiking um, on the Valentine Day also with the team, and uh, it was a successful hike. And we have a yoga class coming for our team also um, this coming March. I was going to ask you, how do you define an unsuccessful hike? <laughs> I was not in the hike, unfortunately, this time. I was very okay. sick, but okay. my team took it over. Okay. Other questions? I've got one right here. I have a question. Sure. Um, in the UCI world, uh, I wasn't always here. I, I've been here right in five years. And I still admire your scores with regards to engagement. I think it's super important. Um, I come from an area, uh, a community organization that is riddled with a lot of um, FMLA and uh, uh, absenteeism. And it's really difficult for somebody like me that's an RN that I am in full support of every single patient in practice in our ambulatory setting as well as hospital. And I struggle because I really try my hardest to A, um, teach people how to be um, elite clinical practice partners with folks. And how important it is that we align ourselves as the front door of this organization. And I don't understand how to penetrate a culture that some of our employees have worked here for 20 plus years. You chose health care, and when you say your choices <coughs> are important, when you choose those areas and you come to work at a place and then you say, I'm not going to come to work, it pains me. I have cried tears. Literally, I've been very frustrated. And I, I want so bad for them to be as passionate as I am about the patients that come here. How do you do that? What is it that you're doing that is creating this vacuum of major engagement, and how can I make that infectious as a leader? Thank you. Um, let me tell you, the first year in UCI, when I came, 
it took me a good a good six months assessing the culture of my team and the culture of the organization and I did it in a very systemic way I mean I was following the book literally I was following the book and I was trying to collect data to see where is the culture where is the weakness what's the strength and then I start to play more on the strength and I start to ignore the weakness because the minute you play on the strength of your team or uh, that point they will start getting out of their weakness and go to the strength area but it took me a good six months this is number one number two I think any team in the world not only in UCI any team in the world will be engaged with you if they see you with them and this is one of the things I am proud of. I have six different teams, and I know the flow of each team. I can do their job as much as none of them can do each other's job. So you need to know what they are doing, and you need to be involved. So when they see you involved, and you are right there, and you are listening to them, and I think this is one of the important things, I always listen to their feedback, and I fight for them. They know that, that I'm an advocate to the team. And there's many times, Pat can tell you, we are on the phone, no, I will do this, no, you will do that. I said, Pat, the team want this, and I'm gonna do the team what they want. And we are always having this back and forth between me and him, because you need to listen to the team, and the team is the one who's gonna take you to the next level, so you need to believe in them. You need to listen, you need to assess, and you need to make sure you are part of them. You are not their boss, actually, um, I have a CEO and a CFO and a, a COO in my team, and I, ke I keep telling them, you are my small C-suite. <laughs> <laughs> and they, are, they love it. They are my small C-suite, and I love them, and I give them these, these uh, 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 titles because they are the one who is running it. So again, you listen to them, you get engaged with them, and you make sure you are part of that team. But it's going to take years, not a simple thing. I have a question for you, uh, Amen, about uh, earlier this week, Song Richardson, the Dean of the uh, College of the School of Law, presented to us on implicit bias. Mm -hmm. I am guessing, I'm going out on a limb here, but I am guessing you have experienced some uh, implicit bias. What do you do directly to address that when you recognize it, question number one, and maybe more importantly, what advice would you have for others when they see it? What would you like to see us do when there is implicit bias that creeps up? Trust me, that's every day okay. I go through my role. The first thing I, the problem I'm passionate person. So sometimes my passion took me, take me to the wrong direction, but I learned something in UCI very, very important. I need to step out, look what is my role in that problem and then I think am I going to be able to do it the right way or I need somebody else with me to do it to be the balance so I will not be falling in that hole so I always step out I learned a very important lesson I should not be reactive to any conflict or any bad I am always starting to step out think about it find what is the right way to do it and I wish everybody in this room do the same thing. Do not react, step out of it, think about it. If you know that you are in that hole, don't do it. And take an advice. Thank you. Yes. So My sister. Yes. <laughs> I'm a Christian sister with this. Yes. <laughs> So one of the one of the things that um, when you were talking about passion, I mean it could be the two-edged sword because sometimes you get a little so passionate. Yeah. Like that, but you're right, you're very good at feedback. But the thing with your passion, I think, has brought your team to where it is now. Because I experienced your team before you came, and they were at, at the lowest morale I've ever seen any team anywhere. You know, some of them shared situations that, I mean, they were just literally like, why do I come to work? I hate it here. And to see that transformation, but I, I really think it has to do with your passion. You know, you are, uh, you engage them with your passion, you learn about them, you do fun activities with them. It's not all about just work, it's other things too. 
the extra time that you've spent with them to help them evolve to what they are now is so impressive. Thank you. And I thank you for your team. I know they're grateful beyond belief. Um, but it, it's just nice to see because it's an inspiration for the rest of us that strive to get there. Um, you know, so. Thank you. Appreciate that, Janice. From somebody witnessed my journey from A till now. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I just have a quick question on the flip side of that. How um, you had stated that you um, kind of play on the strengths and you ignore the. the Not ignore, like subside it a little bit. Yes. Right. And, and, you know, I'm a parent, I've got four children, so I completely understand in that type of manner how to do that. But just in a, in a conflict type of resolution way, um, because you have to deal with that. How, what is your best method to deal with that sort of situation um, for performance improvement with uh, uh, an employee that has areas of opportunity? Wow, I love this question. Let me tell you. Dawn, you are not listening. <laughs> <laughs> she already knows me very well. So the first thing I told the team when I came in, I said, I am not an HR person. I am not going to bring HR to every incident is going to happen here. This is the first thing I said, and I made it real, and they know that. I don't bring HR to every incident I have. Only in one time, and they know what is the one time I'm gonna bring HR, and I'm not gonna discuss it. It's a zero tolerance for me when it's a patient safety. When it's a patient harm or a patient safety, I don't take it easy, and I would love that person to exit, not only to get discipline, to get exit. Because patient doesn't deserve this from us. This is number one. So this is the only time I call HR. Everything else can be done through conversation, adult to adult conversation. And one of the things, I just shared it with the CEO just a minute ago, if I am very passionate about something or I am very emotionally involved in an incident, I don't do the conversation right away. It's gonna take me a good two, three days before I go and I do this conversation with somebody it means a lot to me. Because I need to prepare that crucial conversation in a very professional way, so I don't hurt the person in front of me, but at the same time, I need to take them to the next level where they're supposed to be. And one of the other things, I wanna share it with everybody here, and I shared it with my boss actually the first year I um, joined him. I have an Excel sheet that I write my team, the direct report, and I write their achievements and their misachievements. And I send it to them on a monthly basis individually. And I said, you're doing good in this. You're not doing good in this. Let's see how you're going to improve next month. I did it for the whole first year of me here. Guess what happened this in the second year? I did not need to do that much conversation. Because now they know what I accept and what I don't accept. And then after that, now I meet with the chief. They make me go every three months, which is I'm happy with it. I'm not complaining. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> wow. Last question. Um, so, so, thank you for sharing all the Welcome. great inspiration and your experience. Um, I'm curious, so I have two young boys, and I can't say that my personality is like your personality, but I'm also very passionate about work. I'm a physical therapist, you know, I kind of, you know, can attend all the patient care, and I teach them what they need to do, you know, about mobility, moving a lot. But when I go home as a mother, my boys don't listen. They all have selective hearing, including my husband. <laughs> so sometimes, how do you balance being a strong, independent, you know, pioneer woman, woman, and then going home and transitioning to be a mother? And kind of An excellent question. <laughs> so first of all, uh, before I become a full timer, when I was just a nurse and I, I mean, I mean, a bedside nurse, and I was working three days only, I had more control over the house, and I was like making sure everything in the house is clean and shiny and polished. And you know, I have I'm OCD, and I want everything in colored. And you know, I was that. And then, when I start full time, and I'm in administration, and I'm doing five days, and sometimes six days, and twelve hours, and more, I start to learn something in you called let go. Oh, the bed is not clean. Okay, let's go. Oh, the laundry basket waiting for me. Let's go. But you know what I don't let go? Is my quality time with my kids. I will not sacrifice that for anything in the life. So I make sure every single day, every single day, that I have a quality one hour with my kids. Sometimes I come back home, I'm fully exhausted mentally and physically. But you know what? That one hour gives me all the energy to continue next day. And the only thing I ask, 
how was your day? Give me the best day happened to you, uh, the best thing happened to you today. And guess what? That was the only question. And they will start. <laughs> they don't stop. But the idea that they know I am here to listen, I'm here to share their moments with them. And that's the only question. And let me tell you, it's the best feeling in the world when I park my car in the driveway and the three of them come to me, to the car. It's raining, it's snowing, it's hot. I will never reach the garage door and they are not all, all of them already at the door. So this is the best feeling I always, and this is what drives me every day. The idea is not to be a perfect mom, is the, and not that the controlling mom, the idea that I am there for them and they know that. And again, I have a good husband. <laughs> He's taken a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, such incredible, inspiring uh, stories. And we can't thank you enough for being vulnerable enough to just share uh, so much about uh, who you are. Um, I, I, for one, am really, really glad that you're not in the box very much. Uh, the organization benefits immensely, probably way beyond what you would ever uh, be able to realize because you are thinking and, and working outside of the box. And I appreciate that most because other people see you doing that and we want them to emulate your, uh, your behavior. So thank you for showing all of us how, how to do that. Uh, I have a few other thank yous that I'd like to uh, uh, to make sure that we pass along. Uh, first, uh, what matters to me and why organizing committee. Uh, we want to thank them. Uh, the Advisory Council on Campus uh, Climate, Culture, and Inclusion. Uh, because for their, their support, they brought this program to the Medical Center. And we're really, really grateful uh, for, for that. Uh, Rachel uh, Coral, Teresa Waters, and uh, Sean. Casagande, we want to say thank you for all the behind the scenes and out front work uh, that you did to make this uh, possible. And then uh, on behalf of both Dean Stamos and myself, to all of you that attended, um, thank you so much for making this a priority. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>